everyone. My name is Val DeLockey, and I'm an ecologist at the BLM Eagle Lake Field Office. Um, we put a project together with USGS, and um, it, another, some of our other partners were the Institute for Applied Ecology and the BLM Sagebrush and Prisons Program, and then the Great Basin Institute. Um, I'll start this pro uh, presentation with a little bit of background and then I'll get into the project and um, how it got started and what it is and where we see it going. So to begin with, 2012 was a very big fire year in the West and Eagle Lake experienced a 315,000 acre wildfire. Um, these photos are directly off of our field office. Okay, got it? Yes. Okay, so these photos are all off of our field office. Um, the sage, sage grouse on the left was taken immediately, like the year after the fire. And then um, on the right, it is some planting that we've been doing. And so in 2012, we had the rush fire hit. It was a big fire year across the West. Um, after fire season ended, there was a very big shortage of sagebrush seed. And so, and any other seed, seed was just really scarce that year. Um, anyway, uh, on the map, on the left, on the right here, the blue line is the Eagle Lake field office. The black polygon is the the rush fire perimeter. And then that pink in the middle is um, priority, designated priority sage grouse habitat. And as you can see, for the actively managed area of the field office, most of our priority sage grouse habitat burned in that fire. Um, we were able to do some seeding attempts we were able to drill seed 5,000 acres, and we attempted to aerial seed 17,000 acres. Um, the only reason we even considered aerial seeding at the time was because we were gifted 11,000 pounds of sagebrush seed, and it was Wyoming seed collected in um, eastern Nevada, I believe. As a result, we had some very low success rates. There were some other factors that could have played into that, like such as drought and, um, and seed storage issues that may have occurred. But the photo on the left is some sagebrush that came up in the, furrow, the drill seed furrows. And then on the right, that was a, a seedling that occurred after, the, after we aerial seeded it. Um, we saw a lot of germination at this point, but then a few years later we started seeing some mortality. Um, as a result, we turned to um, planting sagebrush seedlings. This photo is very representative of what our field office looks like today. These are pretty much what the lower elevations look like. This before the rush fire was a sea of sagebrush. Um, 2015 is when I met Shannon and started working with her and the Applied Ecology Sagebrush and Prisons Program. And after that, we went to the project. So this project was kind of just fell in our laps. Um, I've just finished planting 14,000 seedlings and I had 2,000 left. I ran out of crew. I came back to the office. I sat down in my cubicle and my field manager walked in and he said, I just got a call from um, USGS and they want to plant 2,000 sagebrush seedlings out at one of our leks where I was just planting. And I said, okay. And the next week they sent out a crew and um, we went from there. So just you know, for those in the audience who may not know about sage grouse, just a quick note. Um, 
It's in the sagebrush obligate species. They have to have sagebrush in order to survive. Sage grouse eat insects and plant parts. They don't have a gizzard like a chicken, so they cannot eat seeds. And they have different um, needs throughout the year. So, at, and at different times. Earlier in their brood rearing um, and nesting period, they need a little bit thicker sagebrush cover. And then as the brood gets older, they tend to move up higher into the, higher into the uh, elevations and where there's more water and more forb cover and more plant parts for them to eat. And so from there, just moving along, um, planning is an issue. Um, it, as everyone out there probably knows, planning is probably the biggest part of any project. Um, we were lucky, we had a lot of things already in place when this project came along. Um, we had the Rush Fire EA in place for our NEPA, and then um, we had a, an agreement in place that we were able to fund so that we could get crews to, to get out on the land. Um, and then from there, we started our local seed collection, which actually our seed collection happened the, in 2015, the year before we planted, um, I was able to write a contract because I realized that we were coming up on that five year mark after the rush fire. And I wanted to make sure that there was gonna be some, we were gonna be able to have a little bit of seed so that, you know, for areas that we may need to put it down. Um, Anyway, the, so from there, we collected seed from two local seed zones, and um, it was very local. It was so local that the seed that we collected was across the road from the planting site. So after we started working with USGS the year after um, they first came out, we decided to extend the project and find some more sites. So what we did was we looked at the telemetry data and then we overlaid that with where the active LECs were. And um, we also considered site characteristics for each site. We looked at slope and aspect. We looked at what vegetation was there, what soil types we were looking at. If the site was resistance, had resistance and resilience qualities that would Help, help us be successful. That was a big part of it as well. Um, and um, we also, access was huge. If you can't access your site um, in December or November when you're planting, then chances are you're not gonna be able to get your project done. So here's that map again. Um, we chose sites that are within Sage, sage grouse priority habitat and within the rush fire burn. Um, the first site was Smoke Creek Road and that's the southernmost site. The next one north is Chalk Bluff. Those two sites had very low resistance and resilience um, qualities about them. They have very clay, heavy clay soils with shrink swell um, soils. They're very inundated with um, cheatgrass and medusa head but we chose them anyway, just to take a chance. And then the two Northern sites were Hall Spring and Sage Hand Spring. And those two sites were recovering well from the, um, from the rush fire. The perennial grasses were, were back and a lot of the forbs were back. However, they were missing a shrub component. So this is the, the planting design that USGS came up with and um, we decided to go with it. So each plot has four subplots within it. And then within each subplot, there are about 17 intensification sites. So these intensification sites are planted at every, every five meters. And then you also have a plant planted at every meter uh, along each tape. This is what they look like on the ground. They're within two meters, a two meter square, 
and they also are um, they're about 20 centimeters apart. I, I struggled with this part of the project, but um, we just went with it. Um, this is our crew. Uh, one of the crews, actually. This is out at Sage Hen Spring. And as you can see, the perennial grasses are flourishing and doing pretty well. And there are a lot of, there are some forbs in there, not as many as we would like, but there are some in there. These crews, um, the planting crews consisted of U, uh, GBI crews, um, BLM staff, and um, USGS staff. Oh, why did that go that way? There we go. Okay, so now we're into the monitoring part of it, part of the presentation. Um, we used LPI, belt transects, and photo points. This is out at Smoke Creek Road. And as you can see, there's a lot of annual grasses out there, but um, looking out into there, you can see some of the sagebrush that's struggling to come through. And this is the Chalk Bluff site. This is the site that we thought was going to be the worst site, and it's turning into being having some of the best survival rates. Um, a, on average across the board on all four sites within Eagle Lake, the, um, we probably have survival rate of over 35%. USGS is going to publish this paper, so um, I do have access to the numbers and I've looked at them. It's pretty, it's pretty good, but um, I'm just going to let USGS go ahead and, and publish. So moving forward, um, we like to follow the science on Eagle Lake. We've got a lot of other projects going on in there, but out there, but um, we do like to follow the science. Um, for this project, we like to keep collection and planting sites within seed transfer zones and within soil types. We have a lot of different inclusions within our soils on our field office and um, we have some pretty unusual sagebrush hybridization happening compared to a lot of other places like Winnemucca and maybe even um, like out in Elko where you have defined stands of mountain and you have defined stands of Wyoming. We kind of don't have that in this field office. Um, I'm very sold on the quality of sagebrush that BLM has been receiving from the Sagebrush in Prisons program. This is a photo of their root development. Um, I think that root development is very, very important in these seedlings in order to get them in there in the ground and get them to survive. Um, although there are other factors that, that dictate survival, but um, this, this is something that's I think is very important. Um, I like to keep sagebrush as local as possible. Our field office has never had any luck, even in talking to retired folks that worked here years ago. There's been very little success in planting sagebrush ever, and it's probably been because they didn't have access to local seed, like collecting local seed is somewhat new and um, I've never had any luck with stuff I've gotten from Nevada or or out in Utah and so um, from there I think that I would like to continue to keep it local and and even try and keep it within the same type of soil as the parent plant came from. Um, I, I think that we need to utilize the Sagebrush and Prisons project as much as possible. It takes a huge burden off of the planning part on our end. We don't have to manage any contracts. It's all handled from the Washington level and um, or headquarters level. And so at the field office level, it makes it very easy for us to participate in this project. And um, 
I also like to, I would like to consider degraded areas that sage grouse and other species use, even if they don't have promise, those sites could turn around and surprise you. And finally, I, I would really like to thank all the presenters today and all of the researchers out there that are doing all the research that allow us as land managers to take those tools that you do, that you develop and to actually put them on the ground. Um, I would like to thank all, the, all the, the people out there that put these programs together, like Sagebrush and Prisons program and the Seeds of Success program. They've been extremely helpful in allowing us to do a better job at what we're mandated to do. Um, if anybody wants to reach out and speak to me about this offline, the best way to talk to me is through email at this time. Great, thanks, Velda. So we do have a couple of questions for you. And while we, uh, while I ask you these questions, I'm gonna have all the other presenters today start to turn on their cameras slowly. Um, so for your presentation, Velda, what is the success rate of planting seedlings compared to putting seeds in the ground? Much higher. Um, I don't have numbers on that, but um, when we, drill seeded and when we aerial seeded, our numbers were well below 3%. All right. Has there been parallel monitoring of sage grouse in the areas you're planting to see if and when sage grouse return to these areas? Not yet, but USGS does have some crews out that are doing telemetry collection I haven't seen the recent stuff, but um, they are out and about on our field office. They're up in Applegate, and I believe that they're in Nevada in some spots. 